Hello, I'm Graham and I hope everyone's having a great day and welcome to today's video. Now this video is a continuation of a small series I've been producing looking at some of the cameras I've had in the past and then subsequently sold them and then regretted it. Now I've managed to get a hold of one of my favourite cameras which is the Panasonic Lumix LX5. Now the LX5 is a serious amateur camera. It was designed to try and tempt people away from the uh, entry level DSLRs. So it had a lot more features on this camera than you had with your traditional compact cameras, such as full manual control and shooting in RAW. So it's one of the first cameras that were really attractive to uh, advanced amateurs. Now the LX5 was the successor to the very popular LX3. Now I did own an LX3, but the zoom range on the LX3 was only a times three zoom. So you were very limited in the amount of scope you had with it. Now the LX5 has a times 3.8 zoom, which gives you 24 millimeters to 90 millimeters effective focal length. So it gives you a nice 24 millimeter wide angle uh, setup and a 90 millimeter uh, portrait, head and shoulder portrait uh, type setup. So quite a useful camera. It has a unusual um, aspect ratio control, and that's around the lens barrel, which goes from the usual 43 to 3 to 2 to 16 9 for shooting HD video and then on this camera was introduced the 1 to 1 which is the Instagram type square format. The lens itself is an f2.0 at its widest angle and f3.3 at the telephoto zoom setting so quite respectable apertures. As you, with these cameras you really do need to get a lot of light into that sensor to give you good results. Now like the TZ10 that I reviewed previously this again has a CCD sensor and CCD technically can give you better results than the newer CMOS types. Again, the base ISO of this camera is ISO 80, so you can get some really nice noise free images if you keep to that base ISO. Of course, it does mean you need to use quite a bit of light, so um, sunlight or overcast days are ideal for this camera. Now even though we have manual control of the shutter speeds in the camera, so we can go from 60 seconds all the way up to 1 4,000th, in real terms you're going to be shooting at say f4 and that limits the shutter speed to a maximum of 1 2,000th. So you've got a complete shutter range there from 60 seconds up to 1 2,000th. And because this is a leaf shutter, you can synchronize your flash all the way up uh, the shutter speed range. Now it is a multi-aspect sensor, just the same as the TZ10, so we're not losing any of the width when we change aspect ratios. So I always maintain the maximum width and we're just cropping in on the height to give us the aspect ratio that we've selected. Now another nice feature of the camera is that when you take an exposure, you can actually have it make three exposures with different film types. So you can set up three different film types and have the camera process those three different images from that one exposure. Now we do have raw control of the camera so it gives you the opportunity of being able to fine process that to however you want your image to look. But if you're just shooting in JPEGs you can again use that uh, facility within the photo styles to reduce the sharpening and the noise reduction so that you can actually get better images. You're not actually giving yourself JPEG artifacts or smearing because of the noise reduction algorithm. So if you keep those two backed off to minus two you can post process the JPEGs and get some superb, nice, clean images. Now, this camera does support a hot shoe for flash and it marries nicely with the uh, Olympus uh, FL36 or the 360 or with the Nissan i40. Again, it's TTL compatible and you get fine control with the camera. Now you have got manual focusing on the camera and that's selected by the back control dial or by the left and right navigation buttons. And on screen, when you are using manual focus, there is a distance scale, which has a hyperfocal indicator. So you've got a yellow bar there, which shows you the depth of field that you're gonna get with the selected zoom length and the aperture you've got selected. So you can actually use that to make sure that you've got the right zone of focus for the shot that you're taking. And that's a really useful uh, feature, which was incorporated into the FZ2000, but then discontinued for the FZ300, which was a shame because that is a really useful feature. Now this particular camera has no lens thread on the actual lens itself so you can fit filters but what they decided to do was to have a removable ring and in place of it you can then screw on a lens barrel. So this screws onto the actual uh, camera body 
and that then allows you to fit 52 millimeter accessories so if you wanted to use neutral density for getting the right uh, shutter angle for your uh, HD video then you could screw neutral density on the front there or uh, variable neutral density you can use uh, polarizing filters um, and close-up lenses so when you turn the camera on the lens will extend within that area but it won't actually touch the filters that you've uh, screwed into the camera so that's a really useful feature if you want to use close-up lenses or you want to use additional filters to help you with your photography now this camera supports a port on the back here which is for fitting a electronic viewfinder the lf1 i had it when i had my um, lx5 previously um, it was quite an expensive um, accessory. I think it was about £160 when I bought it in 2012. Um, and I didn't really use it that often. Um, with the LCD having the power mode, in bright sunlight you can actually see what you're shooting to get your focus and composition right. Now the sensor in this camera is a 1 over 1 1.63 uh, inch sensor. So uh, with 10.1 megapixels, the actual pixel dimensions are quite large. So again, it's good for those low light situations. The only downside of the CCD sensors is they are easily uh, overloaded or oversaturated. If you've got any bright um, reflections in water, for example, you might see vertical streaks uh, on the image coming from the sensor if it's overstress, uh, particularly if you're shooting video. Now this camera has a mini HDMI port so you can output the HD video that you shot with the camera onto your television. There's the usual combined AV and USB port so you can actually output to a composite TV or you can use the USB output to uh, communicate with a computer to transfer your files from the camera to the computer. It has its own pop-up flash, a very low power pop-up flash uh, which is um, interesting. Um, but again you've got the hot shoe flash if you wanted to have a higher power flash. Now the camera will shoot video, it's restricted to 720p, uh, the centre itself is 25p and the output is rated to 50p if you're in a PAL country or it's 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second output if you're in NTSC. You can also select the motion JPEG if you wanted um, a file which is easier to edit where AVC is compressed you need a, a, a more powerful computer to be able to edit that file but if you wanted an easier to edit program then you can use the motion JPEG. For AVC HD a class 4 card is necessary and for motion JPEG a class 6 card. Now I used to think that 720p was quite a restrictive format but if you look at the use for video these days most of it tends to be for either a YouTube or onto social media and you don't need those 19, 20, 1080 files and certainly you don't need the 4K files. Okay there is the argument of using 4K you can crop into that and have a sort of pseudo zoom but in real terms you don't really need the 4K file or the 1080p. Now I've done some tests using the 720p files for both social media and for YouTube and I find them quite acceptable so there is a reason there for using 720p smaller file sizes you can store more videos on your card and, and you can uh, use them for your social media as well unfortunately the camera doesn't have a mic input so again you'd have to capture your audio on a separate recorder or just use the inbuilt mono mic which is a bit of a disappointment really because AVC HD Lite, the 720p, will actually record in stereo, but uh, unfortunately the mic in this camera is only mono. The TZ10, they decided to employ stereo mics in that design, so uh, if you wanted stereo and you wanted a similar sort of capacity camera, then the TZ10 would give you that rather than the LX5. With the LX5, we now have the facility within camera to zoom while we're recording video which wasn't there on the LX3 um, and we've got a dedicated record button on the top of the camera now so we can record video by the red button. Also got creative video control so we can shoot in manual, program auto, aperture or shutter priority whichever you want to set up for your particular video style. So quite a useful camera designed for the serious amateur and it gives you some superb results. I'll now show you some shots that I've taken with the camera. It was a very overcast day when I shot these in Wigan. Really, really cold, very dark grey sky. So there's very little uh, cloud detail in the sky. But you can see the amount of detail this camera can pull in when you're just using even the wide aperture of f2.0. So a very, very useful camera and one that I'm really happy to have bought again.
Well, that's it for the video. Thanks very much for watching. Check out my photographic blog. I'll put a link to that in the video description below where there's more information on all sorts of uh, Panasonic cameras from the travel zoom up to the Micro Four Thirds system. So as usual, until the next one, please do take care and I'll hope to see you all in the next video. Goodbye for now.